Hello everybody, welcome to tonight's uh, gym series. Tonight we're going to be covering some stuff in FPP7 and Rick Harris is going to let us know all the new details in it and go for fun. Rick, take it away. Alright guys, I'm Rick, like you said, I'm part of the FPP development team. I work mostly just on quality assurance and writing the manual. Um, the developers do the real work. I just kind of hang out in the background. So I'm going to go over what's new in FPP7. So the first thing I'm going to go over is some of the performance behind the scenes things that have taken place. The, you probably won't really notice this, but I thought it'd be good to mention it. Then I'll go over the bug fixes, things that have been problematic in the past that shouldn't be going forward. And then I'll go over the enhancements, which is what probably most of you want to know about. So let's get into it. So the performance behind the scenes issues. So one of the biggest changes was that they upgraded to Bootstrap 5. Uh, what Bootstrap is, is it's the framework to that the GUI interface, the web pages look good on all devices and changes according to the sizes. Bootstrap 4 was end of life, so there was no longer any support. So they pretty much had to upgrade that. Um, with that being said, there might be a couple outlying things that just don't look right or look exactly the same, but as far as performance or anything, it doesn't change anything. Uh, one of the big things that they did is that they separated the PHP processing from the Apache server. Um, with them being linked the way that they were, it was limited to one gig file uploads. And it's crazy that the shows are growing to be so big that they had to do that. So with them separating those processes, now that it can handle up to four gigs. And who knows, that might only be good for another year and people go with, you know, standard million pixel displays. Who knows? But, you know, I think this hobby definitely has grown. Uh, they did some work on the network name handling, the way Raspberry Pis negotiate their uh networks, the, especially the ETH0 and ETH1 on multi-ETH uh, interfaces, was real problematic because it was uh, on the Pi 3s, it was handled at the USB level. So it was kind of problematic, especially for people with color light cards. So they, they did some tweaks on that to make that more reliable. Um, they did a lot of work on the multi-sync monitoring due to cores, which is uh, basically a security protocol between uh, different um, web, web hosts. Um, and that was so that the Genius controller and the Falcon controllers could show up in the multi-sync page so that you get a better user experience to be able to see all the controllers in your system. Then they also worked on some API enhancements, and some of that is for uh, future development. Uh, things like being able to report back to get information um, on different programs would be able to use it and stuff. And I think Cope Lights might be working on something coming out here before too long that's probably going to utilize that. And they did uh, quite a bit of work on general cleanup because with uh, a program that's been around for 10 years and all the upgrades and everything else, it's, it's very common that you'll files that you no longer use are just kind of hanging out in the background. And they did a lot of work on identifying that and cleaning it up. So some of the bug fixes. One of the big issues was special characters. And this is one that might be a little problematic. So FPP, way back when, they weren't stripping the special characters out. Now, special characters on a normal computer system typically aren't problematic. The issue is when you are transmitting uh, strings over HTML and other protocols, those special characters uh, actually create special functions or do different things. So it's real problematic. And way back when it started, most people knew about special characters and weren't using it. And we got a lot of newer users and they started using it. So the developers tried stripping the characters out on uploads and stuff, and that kind of worked, but there was other controllers and systems that that wasn't compatible with. So now they have it configured so that it doesn't strip the special characters, but it handles it properly. Um, there's a lot of testing done on that, and it seems to be working. 
The only issue that I could see with that is if you are not using the most current version of FPP 6.3 or 7, that you might, and running like multi-sync uh, multi with remotes, you might have some compatibility issues that as long as you um, are running the most current 6.3 and or 7, you should be fine. Um, they added some fixes for some Wi-Fi drivers on the new Raspberry Pi kernel. Raspberry Pi came out with a slightly different kernel, and I'm sure it was due to component shortages. Um, and they found out that there were some problems with that, so they up added some fixes for that. Um, for the Pi 4, the DPI pixels weren't working quite correctly. And this was something that was reported. If you see the things with an asterisk, those are things that a user like you guys reported and it was subsequently fixed. But the Pi 4, the DPI pixels weren't working quite correctly due to the timing. So it was reported and then got fixed. A minor issue was GitHub changed the way that some of their hosts were being processed and they had to go in and change some coding to address that. And GitHub does that every once in a while. Another one that was reported was branching playlists. When you branch from one playlist outside of another playlist, when it returned, it was off by one um, and they fixed that. Another one that somebody reported was if you had a custom NTP server, um, FPP wasn't handling that properly. It was still using the, pro the internally programmed one. So they did some fix on that. And they, uh, this one, the fix the initial setup save order, that was one that was problematic. If you logged into FPP for the initial setup using FPP.local, and then you went in and changed the host name, it would save that host name immediately on the device. Well, you're still actually logged into the FPP.local, which basically no longer exists. So every, anything else that you did from that um, wasn't saving because you weren't linking to it. So they changed the, the save order so that it, that would work. Um, somebody else reported on some long running um, FPPs that they it quit responding to web requests. And this was kind of a, a, a one off error, not, not hardly anyone was experiencing it. So they added some stuff in there for that to work properly. So the enhancements, which you guys all want to know about. Um, so people were requesting to have lights just flash to music. Well, um, they added sound reactive WLED effects. So there's a bunch of WLED effects that are now in FPP that will basically blink and flash to the beat of the music, kind of like an auto sequencer. That will only work from sounds being played from FPP. It does not at this point support like microphone or other input. Um, but it will play it to the sound that FPP is playing. Um, FPP command presets. So previously, to run FPP commands triggered from within X lights, like, for example, a snow machine, that every time somebody says they sing, let it snow, or it's cold outside, or something like that, you could trigger a snow machine to blow snow or bubbles or whatever. So Previously, you had to create like a dummy prop in X lights and identify that channel and make sure it doesn't overlap anything in your sequence and then set that control channel in FPP and then set your command preset. And it, it worked pretty well. Well, they added now in X lights two new timing tracks. You have a, a command pre or a FPP command uh, timing line and a FPP effect. And so you can put on that timing line at the moment that you want either the effect or the command to trigger. And when it gets to that point in the time, it will trigger it. You, just, you still have to obviously create the command or effect in your um, FPP device, but it's a, it's a lot smoother and simpler method. Another thing that somebody requested was to add UDMX USB adapter support so that you could run like an SSD drive, like an external type hard drive. It's a lot faster than an SD card. So that has been in there and implemented. So you can actually can run external drives. They are pretty spendy and they do generate heat. So it might not be for everybody, but there is the support to do that. 
Another neat change that they added was auto backup when the settings have changed. Anytime that you change a setting in FPP, it's going to make a backup of what the setting was before. And if something happens to your system, you totally uh, mess up a setting or something, as long as you can get into FPP, you can go back and restore to that point in time. And so that's pretty cool. And you can also download those settings. Um, this one, provision non-existing network interfaces. This is one that's been kind of problematic for people that, um, especially like for the pocket beagle type devices that you only have the one uh, USB port and you usually use that to do configuration, but then because you use it for the configuration, you can't plug in your Wi-Fi adapter. And it was kind of, kind of problematic and, and Daryl C did a good job on getting this in and implemented so that you can now create a non-existent network and then when you uh, power it down plug your network device in and power it back up it'll work so let me show those I'll, I'm going to demonstrate each of these as we go along so I don't get too far lost Okay, so the first one was sound reactive WLED effects. So let me go into FPP command. Overlay model effect. And down here, all down here at the bottom, all of these here, woo, up a little bit more, all of these here with the um, musical note. Those are all sound reactive. And there are a ton of them. Each one is kind of like a slightly different color or effect or whatever. Um, what they are, you probably have to go to the WLED website to see what all that is. That's way too many to document, but that's all the different sound reactive effects. And then you got some other modifications that you could do to it here. Um, FPP command presets. So before, like I said, you'd have to do a control channel. Now you don't. If you just go to FPP commands, let me go to this one here. I think I got it on there. Yeah, so here I've got an FPP command called snow on, and it'll take and turn the GPIO on when it hits that command. Well, if you're in X lights and you have a sequence here, you can add a timing track. And the timing track would be an FPP command. There we go. And turn that off. And then say you want it to trigger right here. Stop. Hit your T. And then you would... You match your, just to match the FPP command. And when the timing got to that point, it would trigger that command on the FPP, which is a pretty slick little thing. Um, auto backup when settings have changed. So if you go over here to so you see here, this is all of the different settings that have changed and they're all here available. If I wanted to restore back to any time, I could restore back to whatever point in time any of these are. And then you can download them, save them, delete them, whatever it is that you want. A provision non-existent network interfaces. And this is, so here, as you see, I don't have a WLAN zero configured on this because I've, I've hooked up to it through, um, I don't have the Wi-Fi adapter installed. So you can go down here and go add new interface, type in the interface. And then you go through here, you can select it, set it up how you want, set up the your SSID and password and everything. And then the next time when you log in, it'll detect it and log in accordingly. And I don't think I mentioned the 
Okay, yeah, and that's where we left off on that. So let's go back to the slideshow. Okay, so the next one, allow all media types to be played from status page. Part of this was because of the um, sound reactive WLED effects before you couldn't play like MP3s and stuff like that directly from the status page. So they added that so that you could do that. Another neat feature that they did is they, they added current monitoring for boards that have uh, e-fuses. E-fuses are an electronic fuse that triggers, but you can also uh, measure current. And with that, um, you can do pixel counting and it will turn the ports off. So no electricity is going out of that port unless they're actually being used. So that eliminates the chance of fires and stuff out there without having to actually turn your FPP device off because it's not outputting any power to the pixels. Um, they created a, a little bit easier way to do EEPROM installs and upgrades. They put a vendor list in there and you're able to select the vendor and the type of board and everything. So if for some reason your EEPROM gets corrupted, um, it should be a lot easier way to get it updated and fixed. Um, they added DPI pixel support for four channel pixels. So now you could use DPI with that protocol. In, in the um, strings page, they added a lot of enhanced pixel testing on there to help you identify strings and everything else. Another interesting thing that was added that uh, they added a breadcrumb in the playlist display. And this was especially helpful for people that were running like Remote Falcon, where it was calling a playlist from within a playlist. And you really didn't know where you were in that chain. You could be you know, a, a playlist calling another playlist and then calling another playlist. And you weren't quite sure where it was going to return. So they added a, a breadcrumb in the playlist so that you could see where you were in that chain. So let's show those. Okay, allow all media types to be displayed. So if you go over here to status page, I guess I need to be a, a player to do that. So now if you look, the media shows up and you can play that directly from here. Uh, current monitoring. So let's go to that. So here's the current monitoring page, and this shows you all the ports. The X means that it's not outputting any current. And you see there's no current going because I have all the lights off right now. Now you can count the pixels. I've got a hundred count string, I think uh, 26, I think, and something else, I don't recall. It's a couple short strings. And if I count the pixels, it'll go through, count the pixels, and then report. So they got one string 86, one string 26, and one string 100. And what it'll do, just to kind of let you know, is it'll keep the last pixel that it identified and keep it lit up white just to help you see where it might be. And if you have a bad pixel in the middle of the chain, it, it might have miscounted, but that's because it's a little bit less. And you see here that. The, the ports 1357 are, are all on, but there's like hardly any current going out through those because there's no pixels on there. So it's not outputting, but the other ones have a little bit of current going out to it because it does have some pixels. Um, the EEPROM upgrade. Now this one, because I'm not, I don't have these hooked up except kind of a funky way. I might not, oops, I want to go Cape Info. Might not be able to see these, but we will see. And I got a terrible network here. So the EEPROM upgrade, you select a vendor, select the Cape or hat that they have, and um, then you can choose the, the EEPROM and upload it from here because this doesn't have Wi-Fi, because this isn't connected to the network, it's not gonna link to their sites. Um, DPI pixel support for four channel pixels can't go over. Oh, pixel testing in the strings page. This one is, hmm? 
So in your output page, there's a lot more enhanced testing. You can do a port number. And if you click on port number, it will light up the first so however many pixels that are on that port, right? And, and then the rest will light up uh, flashing red, green, blue. Let me share my camera here for a second. And you can see this here has, you might not be able to see, two white pixels and then the rest are flashing. So that tells me that I'm connected to port two. And then you have pixel count by port. And what that will do is that will light up 10 pixels. Uh, let me display this, you might be able to see. It'll light up 10 pixels at the beginning of the string. You have 10 pixels, and then at the 11th pixel, it'll change pattern again. So if you're pushing a prop, it kind of keeps you, you know, so you can count 10. Um, this is the, the Australian version. Don't want to count by our stupid 12s. Count by what actually makes sense. Count by 10s, which, and then it goes on. Then you have... You have the pixel count by string, and the pixel count by string basically does the same thing, except if you have virtual strings in your port, like here on, on port two, it goes through, it has 12 pixels. So it will do 10 pixels one color, two pixels the, uh, the next color, then it'll start the series over again. So if you have like uh, multiple props that you're trying to wire together, um, I don't know who would wire them together at the same time, but if you do, that would help. And then you have your regular uh, regular testing that you do that right from the string page. Um, add the breadcrumb in the playlist. So that one I really can't demonstrate without hooking all types of stuff up. But here you can see, here's how you have, it was the Christmas one playlist. But it, it, you have the RF Christmas playing inside of that, and then it's playing all I really want from that. So that's the, the breadcrumb, how that works. So let's get back to the slideshow. Okay, so more enhancement. They added the Genius Controllers to the multi-sync page, so you can do that. Um, this is another thing that Daryl C. did. Um, a lot of people, when they were using a player remote, it, was, it wasn't it was real obvious that you needed to enable multi-sync. So Daryl moved that to the main page so that you could see it better. Um, another thing, when you're scrolling through FPP, sometimes you had to scroll a whole lot to get back to the top of the page. So they added a, a top button and also a warning button. If you make a change that requires a reboot or restart FPPD, uh, it wasn't real obvious that that was there because it was at the top of the screen and you couldn't see it. So they added a little pop-up where now you could see that right on the page and get to there quickly. Um, another Daryl C. enhancement was they added FPP to the Raspberry Pi imager. So now you can go to the Raspberry Pi imager and it'll download the Pi images and the BeagleBone images are going to be here shortly. If he hasn't already done it, I'm not sure. Um, but the BeagleBone images will be on shortly and you, you don't have to download the image first. You can just use the Raspberry Pi imager to install your FPP. Another thing that people requested was that they had isolated show networks that didn't have access to the outside world. And they had some BeagleBone devices and some FPP or some Pi devices, but you weren't able to do an FPP OS upgrade without jumping through hoops. So now your one player that does have access, you can allow, you can download FPP OS files for a different platform, and then you can send that to it, to the devices for it to upload, which is a pretty neat uh, feature to have if you have an isolated network. So let's demonstrate what I can on those. Let me turn this off. Okay, 
So adding the genius controls to multi-sync can't show that, but the multi-sync I can. So go to multi-sync. And now the multi-sync is here available. And so before it was hidden down in the more settings, so it's done. Um, add a top warning button to get you back to the top of the screen. If I scroll down here, you see now you have a top. It'll take you immediately top. If you something got triggered where there was a warning, uh, like restart FPP or whatever, there would be a, another one down here, say, warning. Um, Oh, one thing I didn't mention was adding a warning banner when trying to play sequences that don't exist. If you have a player remote, and I must have, I got this on remote. Let me see if this works. So if you, it wasn't real obvious sometimes on remotes that if you were you played a sequence and you forgot to upload it. It wasn't real obvious. And so if you play this, now you get a warning that the dummy device, because it just doesn't have audio, but also on your player, your remote, I mean. And I must have not deleted that file. Oh, you know what? I didn't enable multi-sync. Here I talked about it but I didn't do it. It's not going to send a signal out if I don't tell it to. Rookie mistake. And I think I didn't wait long enough for that to reset. Is this set to remote? Yeah. Let me try this again. Of course, you know it worked when I did all my testing, and I don't know why it's not playing right now. I'm sure I'm doing something wrong. Okay, well, I know it works. We'll see what happens. Um, allow FPPOS download for different platforms. If you go to, um, I probably won't have it available because this doesn't have, yeah, so this doesn't have uh, internet access. So I, if I did down here at the bottom, I would have the option to, to select all platforms and I would be able to download FPPOS files for other devices. So if I had a Pi, it would download the BeagleBone and vice versa. Let me turn this off here. And, okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, if the Wi-Fi um, tethers, if it goes to Wi-Fi tether mode and it has an OLED display, you'll get a QR code on the OLED display that you just scan and open right to 192.168.8.1. A little bit of a shortcut to help you get there. Another one that was a user requested was to allow local sequences to override the remote. And this was one that uh, someone requested because they had a Santa mailbox and if some and it was a remote and it was playing the sequences, they wanted the ability to be able to play a locally stored sequence to override it. So now you have that option to do that. They did some work on some Wi-Fi performance enhancements to try and get Wi-Fi to work better. Uh, this new technology came out and they incorporated that. Uh, now the FPP background color has been exposed so that you could get that information to other devices. Um, and I already mentioned about the beginning of the framework to support USB attached devices for SSD drives. So let's look at those. Okay.
we can't we really can't talk about the show the QR code uh, over allow over local sequences to override. So that'll be in an FPP setting. And I believe that is going to be input output. Actually, I think you gotta be on a remote for this to actually work. That would make sense. Yep, so you have to be in remote for that to be available, obviously, and how you, you can have local sequences override. Um, the FPP background color, it, If I go to multi-sync, you see here the background color is showing up in the multi-sync, the color, and it also shows up in the title bar. So you have the green and the purple and that. So if you are used to using the colors, it makes it easier to identify just quickly. And that takes care of that slide. So. They added some more function testing functionality from the OLED screen. So now from the OLED screen, you can actually uh, send multicast packages out to other devices. So that, that's another neat feature. They added support for the 1024 by 600 touchscreen if you're using a Pi in kiosk mode, which not too many people are, but there were some requests for it. And they added a description description field for proxy hosts a lot when before you had a proxy host just had an ip address and a lot of people don't really remember all the, all the mumbo jumbo numbers but they wanted a description to know what it is so they added that uh, description field in there so let's show what that is that's the last of the enhancement so let's see they so really the only thing on this one was the proxy host. So now if you add an FPP, you can do the host name and then you can put a description. Okay, so I'm sure everybody's question is, should I upgrade? The short answer is yes. The question is, is when should you upgrade? Because almost everybody's going to at some point at least upgrade to seven now or somewhere down the road, if not down there. But in my opinion, there's really only one reason why you shouldn't upgrade now. And that would be is if you have a show playing right now or you're going to start a show in the next week or two. And the reason I say this is because at some point you'll probably be updating to version seven. Now, I do hear a lot of people state that they're not going to upgrade now until all the bugs are worked out. But to respond to that, let me explain the FPP development process to give you a better understanding and a better decision making process. I don't care if you update now, wait for whatever, I, you know, it's just up to you, but I think more knowledge is better. So the developers, they'll develop a plan on what they want to achieve in the next release. These changes are typically driven by issues or user experiences, and then they go through it. So they start making changes in the master branch, and the master branch is available for anyone that wants to use or test these new features, but that's not considered stable. Once they do make the changes, there, there's a lot of people that are running the master branch and doing a lot of testing through the years. And once the developers feel that that's a pretty uh, decent, basically, uh, Proof of concept, they'll do the alpha image to try and get some input. They got the framework. And it's been pretty, pretty well tested. You've got Pat Delaney, who's kind of the man of every device, and he'll test every scenario that you can think of. And if people uh, mention something, he'll go through and test it so that they can get it fixed. Um, and a lot of times at that alpha release, users will report how they how they think FPP could work better for them. 
And if it's a good idea, the developers will change it and implement stuff to make FPP a lot better. So the alpha version is really the place to suggest major changes to get FPP to work the way you want it to work for you. Now, once the developers have fixed any bugs identified in the alpha release and they've pretty much polished the code, then, they get, then they'll, and it's been extended tested pretty extensively, they'll release the beta version. And the beta version is really the final version, but they're just hoping people would do some testing because at that point, any bugs that show up are due to weird configurations or one of the million different configurations that we didn't think about testing. So if you uh, test it and identify the bug, it'll get fixed. If you don't test it, and later on down the road, you upload and somebody doesn't have that same configuration that caused the bug. Guess what? You're still going to have that bug. So waiting for the bug to get fixed, you might be one of the few that identifies that. The problem with bugs, there's literally a million variables involved using FPP or any software, and there's no way to test it all. So the, so the problem with the rationale to not upgrade until all bugs have been resolved is that your configuration or usage might be slightly different than others. And even after the final version has been out for a while, when you do upgrade, you can expose a bug that was unknown. To expose bugs the way you're going to use the software early in the process, give you the ability to change it and make it work for you. But it's your show, and you, you have to decide what's best for you and what will impact your show the, the most and how to make it better. So, you know, that's totally up to you and your decision. But other than that, that's about all I got. Anybody have any questions? I have one question. So okay. this, this is an uh this is also from X Lights too, right? All the changes what do you mean from X Lights? All, all the changes that were made. Well, there, there were some changes in X Lights that was made too. Yeah, not only for FPP but other stuff as well. Yeah. Okay, um, so my biggest thing that it might have already been done or there might be a way to actually do it. Um, let me share my screen. So when you select something, you can't see it no more. Uh, the old versions, you know, would actually highlight and you'd be able to see what's actually selected. But you can't see it no longer. Is there a way to change that or? It, works it looks for like me. it's selected what there under the sense spinner there. Mike, save this till after the class. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it works for me, but that's a X lights type thing. So, yeah, that looks like a highlight yeah. color was an issue. Uh, Rick and Dan, have the uh, have the plugins been reviewed at all? Um, I know that not many are used, but there are a handful that people um, probably still use. And that's that's actually one of the bigger issues right now is is getting this out there. Um, I know a couple of the plugins had big issues with the Bootstrap Five upgrade. Uh, like the the big buttons plugin had to be completely redone for Bootstrap Five. Um, I think there's the NFL uh score thing i think that one still has some issues uh but that's obviously not not one that we have actually have any control over yet either um so any help with that uh, i and i've reviewed some of them and, and installed some of them uh but uh, can't, there's can't so many specifically wasn't there matrix tools or, or a drawing thing that was common a couple of maybe even if they were tagged with you know not tested or have been tested something like that would be helpful Possibly, I, yeah. I, I don't projector. think we have any ability to tag those yet. So, no. <laughs> yeah, I did test the projector well. plugin. <laughs> that one works. So, yeah, okay. just just a little tag in the notes might be handy. Yeah. So, and again, that's I mean, part of getting, this, getting, and getting the beta them. out there to people. It's just just get those to a point where uh, you can get into people's hands so they can start testing these serious things and reporting bugs and and getting them fixed. Sooner the better. <laughs> if someone wants to go through and test them, we can mark the one don't work with FPP7 and then they won't appear. Yeah.
I have a question about FPP upload and the versions being supported. So I know that uh, FPP upload won't work on uh, older versions, if I understand correctly. Is there going to be any um, any sort of message that appears, you know, when you attempt to upload to a version that's no longer supported? Uh, well, most likely the connect? FPP Connect won't even show things that it can't upload to. So there won't really be a reason to display a warning other because it's just not there. Um, for FPP Connect, now the channel input output things buttons on the uh, controller tab, uh, yeah, there will be a, a message that will pop up saying, I can't understand this. And I think there's already, I think there already is a warning that pops up. Um, I can't remember. I have to look. So sometimes people use FPP to, to connect to find their devices. So mm -hmm. if, if it's not going to be there at all, I'm wondering if, if it could be grayed out or changed color or something else rather than not being there completely. Um, I think that might lead <laughs> to some frustration with uh, users going, hey, well, I, I, I know it's there. I can ping it. Why won't FPP connect, you know, yeah. uh, see it, et cetera? It's also possible. We, could, we may be able to display it and just not put the checkbox at the, on the first column that, said, that allows you to select it. Yeah, um, that might be. Yeah, yeah. I, so so I, I, we, we have to look into that a little bit more. I mean, that whole FPP Connect is on my to-do list of things to uh, rework probably in August, September timeframe, because uh, with the new APIs that we have up in FPP 7 specifically, but even 6.3 latest code, uh, I'm hoping to be able to do a lot more uh, with parallel uploads rather than doing serial. Um, okay. Uh, so, so basically, like when you hit the go button in FPP Connect, rather than having that one progress thing come up, it'll be just like the uh, status when you're doing rendering, where it would have like a set a progress bar for each remote, and you would be able to see the progress for each one and stuff like that. So, um, oh, cool. uh, it should be a lot quicker um, to to get things out to to all the remotes and stuff like that. And uh, but again, that's that's on my to do list. So I've been trying to get FPP out first. <laughs> yeah yeah understood yeah I, I just bring that up because there's a there's been times where you know when when in the middle when versions were changing on versions of 6.3 there was upload issues and people were having it was you know claims it's successful but then it doesn't show up or it shows up for various odd you know with odd yep patched on zero etc but okay cool thanks so when will version 7 be officially released then uh, I was hoping to have it done uh, like three days ago, uh, but I got busy on some other stuff and prepare it because uh, uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, I was not planning on actually being a vendor here at like for those of you that don't know, um, I'm actually a vendor at Expo. Uh, it's my first experience ever being a vendor at a conference, and so uh, I ended up getting sidetracked on just preparing stuff uh, to obviously ship here and and <laughs> get things ready to to demo and show and all that stuff and and so uh fpp7 didn't get released so hopefully in the next week or two when i after i get back uh and things settle i can like go through the bug reports that are people finding and um unfortunately while i'm setting up today i'm finding other bugs uh in fpp that i'm fixing and, and i'll probably be up tonight fixing a few more um but uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and that's and that's where like with the alpha and beta images that are out, Pat does a lot of testing. I do a, a lot of testing. Daryl C does a lot of testing, and I know Dan does a lot of testing. But but it's so hard to test all the different things that the different combinations and stuff. And in order to get as minimal bugs as possible, it really helps when people download that. And if you're not downloading the alpha and beta versions uh, just because you're waiting for bugs you're really doing yourself a disservice because what the bugs that you might have are ones that aren't going to be identified until you actually do it and now it's that much closer to game day so you know you might want to consider that now if you've got a show that's running are you going to run big... in, in just a week or two then yeah 
And the big thing is if you still have a show set up, like, uh, like, okay, you had a July 4th show on July 5th, 6th and 7th, try the betas on them and, and see like the, 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 the stuff is there. Cause uh, like, I don't have things like the, during the year, the only thing I have set up is a couple of devices sitting in my, on the desk in my office. And you can't really do like, I want to say like production level testing out in how it works with lots of real lights and stuff when I only have like two or three devices sitting on my desk with like one string of pixel or something. So, Have you thought about uh, making the download for the beta and stuff visible without having to go through and set up and uh, promote yourself on the uh, services? You mean it's like an auto as part of the, when you go to the upgrade page? Go to the upgrade page and then it'd say seven beta or yeah, something well, like that. The MPPOS beta is in that list. If you, uh, Pat, uh, I mean, Rick couldn't show it because the device still isn't connected um, to the internet. But uh, if, if you have one that's connected to the internet, you should be able to go to that list and see the uh, seven FPPOS files. And I know before you had to go up to administrator or something like that to get it to go, or developer, to get it to show up. Yeah. No, it, it's in the upload. It's in the upgrade okay. page now. Okay. Well, he's, he's talking just, like, about two different things. Couldn't show it. We're talking about two different things. He's talking about getting the master branch, and yes, you do have to go to developer to go to the master branch. But okay. if you want to run the FPP seven. OS upgrade that is there, and then okay. that'll take, that'll in fact that probably will switch you to master branch, won't it? It would, yeah. Okay, so okay. just to, to make it clear, you, there were two different companies. You, know, you were asking about the one thing, and Rick was answering the other. But if you do if you do the FPP OS upgrade, it will then automatically switch you to master branch. Okay. Is there a decoder ring for all your different variants? I'm asking because what you just said, Patrick, if you're on this version, you have to go get the OS. If you're on this version, you don't. Is there anywhere that's written down? No, there's, the, there, there's two ways to get to it. Patrick was just mentioning there's two different ways. You get the same results. But, but no, to, to answer your question is we are changing the naming convention of the FPPOS files right. with 7. Um, so that it will say 7.0-202307 or, or whatever month it ends up being. So you can kind of compare it to the OS level, which should be right, listed right above it in the, uh, that you have currently on the device. So you can kind of see what you have and, and what would be installed. I think what he was asking for, because he, he, and he messaged me during the presentation, is a matrix that says... Um, FVP, or I'm sorry, Xlights version XYZ supports these versions of FPP. And, the, you know, I think oh, well, for we need to do is yeah. say, all right, Xlights, if you want to still run FPP 5, whatever, this is the, the last version of Xlights that you can use for that. And yeah. then Xlights XYZ supports 6.3 latest forward. That, I think they're looking for that map of yeah. what yeah. versions. Yeah, because cause you know, you know, Pat, we get all kinds of questions about. You've been in there every Saturday. You know what I'm talking about. Yep. Yeah, I can't remember when the cutoff it was. Like 2023.05 or 06, I think, when the initial seven support was added. Um, but, but basically, if you're if you're Going with FPP seven, you need you should have nine or ten because uh, of the bug fixes. Yeah. Um, and then if you're have stuff older than six, I think you'd have to stop at oh uh, four, I think, or oh three. Okay. But you understand the confusion we get, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, there was like few. There was like a few versions in there, like the, the, yeah, yeah. the four, five, six, seven. Huh. While we were trying to figure out the the new. Uh, upload APIs. The, the big issue there was was splitting, uh, and, and Rick mentioned that we we pulled PHP into a separate process, the the PHP FPM process. Um, yeah. On the 32 bit machines, 
that limits the file sizes to two gig as soon as right. we did that. Right. Um, so we had we had to introduce all new file upload APIs uh, that sends it in sends the file in chunks. So it, it does like hundred meg chunks rather than trying to send the whole big four gig file because it, it was I knew it wasn't going to work. Um, so. So there, there's obviously some bugs there that we worked out over a few versions of X lights. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. How will that affect the uh, ES Pixel Stick V4 with the local SD card playing FPP remote? Will there be an issue uploading to those? It shouldn't. Um, the big question is whether, and I don't. I, I don't know the answer to this. Um, I'd have to talk to Martin. It, it would be a small change if needed. Uh, to support the new timing tracks, the FPP timing tracks, uh, there's a very a couple of very minor changes in the FC, FSAQ file format um, that uh, I don't know if the ESP Pixel 6 were designed for that changes or not. Like those... those Anything from like FPP five four, I think introduced the changes that were necessary for those for those changes uh, to understand the file format. And again, I don't know if the SP Pixel sticks can recognize those or not. Right, um, but uploads will continue to be okay. Yeah, so, yeah, should. Thank you, hey, Alex. Um, Air Cookie put out a new build for the Pixel sticks. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I have the twenty nine one. Well, yeah, day before yesterday. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody actually, have? Go ahead. No, actually, I was just thinking, thinking the the ESP Pixel sticks don't use the compressed FSAQ files because they can't uncompress things, um, and those changes were only in the compressed versions, so <laughs> they they wouldn't have been affected by those changes anyway. So, technical details. Sorry. Anybody else have any questions for the FPP people? Will the HTTP virtual matrix come back? It's still there. It's just it's different to configure because it's layered. Um, with the old version of the of the virtual matrix, that it was just really just the, the matrix out onto the HTTP port, where now you basically treat the HDMI port as a uh, basically a buffer and you can actually lay multiple matrices onto that um, the so you, you can actually then create some matrices and stuff like that with it so it's still there it's just it's a little bit different to configure okay thank you yeah it, it provides a lot more power but it's a little bit more complicated to configure. I know Daryl complains about it. So, <laughs> is there a way to back up a file? Back up the file um, externally. Is that a feature that you could put in there now? It is there. It's been there. Yeah. File oh. backup. Rick, go show it. <laughs> There's actually a bunch of new options with the backup stuff. Um, like if you have a uh, like a thumb drive installed on I, uh, you can actually have your a remote back itself up to the thumb drive on like the the Pi Master or something like that as well, um, and have that done semi automatically or or so. I, I don't know all the details. I, Jared's done an awesome job handling all of backup things. I know it, it, if you're using a Pi, um, it backs it up on the SD card, but if the SD card becomes corrupt, then... I believe, I believe it gives you a USB option as well. If you plug yeah. a USB drive in, and I think it will also let you... I think it will let you map a drive? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, I, they're, they're, they, the, the last two days, there's been a bunch of commits. Um because uh, if you're dealing with slower networks or large files, uh, certain things were timing out when trying to, to like, and that option actually allows you to back up everything, like sequences and music and video and everything. So you could end up transferring uh, three gig 
media files or, or whatever um, over to the uh, remote instance and we were getting some weird timeouts and stuff so again these, these are people testing in the field with these things and reporting bugs and and uh people responding to them and stuff which is which is awesome yeah because i'd be interested in doing it to like a one drive Anybody else have any other questions? Oh, Rick, I want to say thank you for a great presentation. It's great to see all the new things that's being rolled out and be available in the next couple of weeks. Dan, thanks for answering some of the extra questions that can get fun with this product. So with that, we'll stop the recording and go from there.